Welcome to Building Command Line Interfaces with ArgParse. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about the ArgParse library, which is part of Python's standard library collection. ArgParse helps you process command line arguments passed to your script. In this course, you'll learn about the ArgParse library, positional and optional arguments, handling different types of data, consuming multiple arguments, and how to write subparsers. Everything in this course was tested using Python 3.10. The ArcParse library was introduced in Python 3.2. Most of this course can use 3.2 or newer. There are a few items that were introduced later. I'll point them out as I go along. Although there are GUI things and web things out there, the vast majority of Python scripts are command line programs. There are programs that don't require input, but most need something from the user to act upon. It's just the nature of code. There are different ways of getting input from the user. You can read a configuration file, you could use the input function, or take in arguments on the command line. This course is about argparse, a standard library module that helps you do that last one. Command line arguments can be a bit tricky. You can get at all of them in the argv list of the sys module but processing them by hand can get messy fast. Everything passed in on the command line is a string. If you need a number, you have to remember to convert it. Some of your arguments might be optional, or you may need more than one. For each of these cases, you're going to need to write a bunch of if statements to handle that. Command line flags, like dash h, can get complicated. They're usually allowed to show up in any order. Some flags also have parameters that go with them, which means you have to consume more than one thing out of your sys.argv at a time. And if you want really messy, you might have groups of arguments, some of which have to be together or are mutually exclusive of each other. As I'm sure you've guessed by my late night infomercial style intro of everything's hard, isn't there an easier way? Well, there's an easier way. The ArcParse library does all these things and more. No tin cans were hurt in the filming of this commercial. ArcParse actually isn't Python's only foray into dealing with the command line. It was introduced in Python 3.2 and replaced an older module. ArcParse is far more powerful than its predecessor, but even with that, there are also all sorts of third-party libraries out there that can do even more. At the end of this course, I'll point you at some alternatives. But why wait? Let's dive into ArcParse. In the previous lesson, I gave you an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll show you the basics of the ArcParse library. ArcParse is a powerful library for managing command line arguments to your Python programs. It's part of the standard library, so there's nothing extra to install. You do have to do a bit of work, though. There are five basic steps. You need to import ArcParse, create a parser, add arguments to the parser, and once you've got that all configured, you call the parser's parseargs method, which does exactly what it says. It parses the command line and returns to you a namespace object. That namespace object contains flags and data of what arguments were used. You use this object to control the execution of your script. Let's go see some examples. I'm going to start without argparse so that you can see the difference. The script in the top window here takes a couple of command line parameters and prints out a statement a number of times. To get at what was passed in on the command line, you need the sys module. More specifically, you need the argv part of the sys module. Note that I'm using the second item in this list. The first item contains the name of the calling program. This may seem strange, but it is to be consistent with the way things have been done in Unix programs since the dawn of time. Well, not quite that old, but near enough for our purposes. I'm storing the first argument from sysargv in the name variable. Then the second argument is being converted to an integer and stored in num. As I mentioned before, everything off the command line is a string, unless you do something to change that, like I have here. Lines 8 and 9 use these two variables to print out Hal's protesting statement to name and it does that num times. Let's run this. Passing in Dave and three gives the famous 2001 movie quote three times over. 
Let's try it again. This time I'm going to forget something. Well, that's not terribly friendly. A better written program would have checked the length of argv and printed out a message if it was too long or too short. Let me try something else. Right number of arguments, but the wrong type. Spelling out three is no good. It blows up the call on line six. Again, you could write some code that checks this or handles it better, or you could use argparse. It slices, it dices, it makes short work of tomatoes. Oh, and it parses the command line too. This new program is the argparse equivalent of what you just saw. A couple of lines longer, but it has way more error proofing than the previous example. As the previous example had none, that's not particularly hard to achieve. To get started, you have to import the arg parse library. Then you create a parser. Once you have a parser, you call add argument to add an argument to the parser. In this case, I've called it name, which is consistent with the previous program. On line six, I do the same thing again, but for num. I also do one more thing, which is tell argparse that this argument is expected to be an integer. It will automatically convert it to such for me and handles the case if the user gives me something that can't be converted. With my arguments defined, the last step is to invoke the parser using the parse args method. Notice you don't have to do anything with sys.argv. It does all that under the covers. Finally, lines 10 and 11 are essentially the same as before. The only difference is instead of using name and num as variables, I am accessing them from inside of the args namespace returned from parse args. Fire up the command line. No difference there. Hmm, that's better. Instead of crashing, you get a usage message and an indication of the problem. The num argument is required. And as for the type conversion problem, again, much cleaner than before. That's it. It's all you really need. Short course, huh? Wait, but there's more. Next up, I'll show you how to improve your help messages and dig into the different kinds of arguments. Are you waiting for a Monty Python reference? Uh, you're in the wrong room for that. In this lesson, I'll show you how to add some help text to your script and introduce positional and optional arguments. The more arguments your program takes, the more confusing it can get. Go Google all the valid arguments for the ls command on Unix. Confusing is an understatement. Thankfully, argparse provides a mechanism for writing help. All you need to do is add some extra parameters to your argument parser object, and you're good to go. Let's go take a look at one. Inspired by the Matrix movie, th there was only one. I I'll fight you. This program prints out columns of random characters so that I feel cooler when programming wearing sunglasses. On line four, I'm using the string library to string together, see what I did there, a bunch of characters. The string library defines some constants that are a subset of the ASCII table. Here, I'm creating a single string comprised of all of the upper and lower case letters, the numbers, and some common punctuation. The argument parser class can be configured to change the behavior of the parser. Here, I'm going to show you some parameters that affect the help message. This first parameter I'm passing in is prog. You use this to change the name of the program in the help message. Without this, the name will be the full matrix.py. Set the way I have, it will be just matrix. Recall the previous lesson where I was arguing with Hal. If I didn't put in the right command line arguments, I got a usage statement. On line 8, I'm overriding the default one, inserting an appropriate keanoism into the beginning of the string. Note the use of the percent parentheses prog variable indicator. argparse will replace this with the name of the program which, of course, I just overrode on line 7. Line 9 gives the user more information about what the program does. This will appear after the usage statement in the whole help description. And line 10 allows you to write some more text that appears after
after the whole help. I'll just scroll down here. The rest of this is the same kind of thing you've seen before. I've defined an integer argument, and then I call parse args. Lines 16 through 18 do the work of printing the columns. If you haven't seen random choice before, it randomly chooses a single item out of an iterable. In this case, it will be one character out of the text string variable. I'm doing that 20 times in a list comprehension in order to get 20 columns of output. On line 18, I print the columns by joining the content together, putting some space in between. All of this will be done args.num times. Taking the blue pill, or is it the red one? I can never remember. And there you go, random screen characters. Of course, all that work was done to make the help prettier. So let's go look at the help. The command without arguments shows the modified usage line and both the usage line and the following line use the modified name of the program. Well, what about the other stuff? For free, argparse gives you extra info through the use of the dash h argument. This shows the same usage statement, then the description. It then goes through each of the arguments, there's only one of them this time, as well as showing you other options that can be used. The only option available is the automatically created dash h. At the bottom of the help text is the content from the epilogue. Told you it was pretty. Not Keanu pretty, but pretty enough. I kind of glossed over this in the previous example. ArgParse handles both positional and optional arguments. The number of rows in the matrix script was a positional argument. In fact, because I didn't say otherwise, it was a required positional argument. If I passed anything on the command line besides a single number, I would get an error. Well, that's actually overstating it. There is one other thing I can pass. That's the dash H flag. This is known as an optional argument and indicated by flags. In most Unix programs, it is common to support both single and double dash flags, where the double dash is a human readable word and the single dash is a short form, typically a single letter. Dash H isn't your only choice of an option. You can define your own flags. Let's go do that. You'll find it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Wait for it, that'll make sense in a second. Or of course, if you're not into the silver screen, that beans thing is going to seem rather abstract. Anyhow, the Casablanca script shows off the use of optional flags. I've written a little Mad Libs program here, filling in one of the world's most famous movie quotes with whatever you provide on the command line. The first optional flag is the place flag. Notice how you tell argparse that this is a flag instead of a positional argument. You name the argument with either a single or double dash in front of it. I've done both here, which means the user can specify either dash p or dash dash place as their argument. Because I haven't specified otherwise, this flag expects an argument to go with it. In this case, it's going to store whatever the user gave to the first flag inside of the args.place namespace item. I then do something similar to define the city flag. Here, I've also added a default value. If the user doesn't provide a city flag, args.city will contain the string towns. Line 8 is like line 6, but for a verb. And line 9 is a little different. It uses the action parameter to change what happens when this argument is used. Passing store true to action tells argparse to change its behavior in a couple of ways. First, what gets stored in dash r is a boolean. Second, it does not expect a parameter to go with the flag. This flag is a pure flag. It is either there or not. Like in line 7, I provided a default value here. Also, in this case, there's no double dash version. Having both kinds of flags is good practice, but argparse lets you do whatever you want. Scrolling down. Lines 13 and 14 are where I print out the results. I do this by accessing the optional flags the same way I accessed the positional ones. If you have both a single and a double dash argument, argparse will store it using the long form name, and in either case, without the dash or dashes. You can control this, but I'll show you how to do that later. 
On line 16, I check for the dash R flag, which in this case is short for Rick. If the Rick flag is on, then Rick spits out his catchphrase after the Mad Lib. Yes, I know these are from completely opposite ends of the movie. Never mind that. All right, here we go. And there it is, using a mix of dash P, dash V, and dash R flags. As dash C wasn't given, the default was used. Since these are flags, argparse doesn't care about the order. Order is all mixed up, but it still works. Unless otherwise indicated, flags are optional. There'll be more on that later too. Unlike with required positional arguments, the program doesn't spit out an error message. The default value for any argument in argparse is none unless you specify otherwise. You specify otherwise by using the default parameter like I did with towns and false for the dash C and dash R flags. Without the flags, I end up with of all the none in all the towns in all the world, she none into mine. It's a very Python-esque Mad Lib. Let's look at the help. That time, instead of using dash H, I used dash dash help, the long form. And argparse shows all the possible flags. It indicates which takes a parameter, shows you the names of the parameter, and the flag. Later, I'll show you how to make this prettier. Maybe not Bogart pretty, but prettier nonetheless. I showed you the store true action in this lesson. There are actually several others as well that allow you to control the arguments. Actions shout louder than words. Again with the oblique foreshadowing. 